Hey everyone, geophysicist Stefan Burns here. Two big updates for you. We've had magnitude 6.8 and 6.4 earthquakes rupture off the coast of Japan. That looks likely to actually increase in severity. That could be a foreshock sequence. We also, at the same time, have had a 1.7 X-class flare blast off from exactly Earth direct and bullseye launching a coronal mass ejection out towards the Earth. We can see that with our CCOR1 coronagraph view. Here we see that full halo coronal mass ejection. We're just getting this imagery in. I'm reporting on it very fast after it occurred. We don't have a space weather model from any of the different agencies as I'm recording this now, but based off of the velocity of this coronal mass ejection, how it pushes out, it's exactly Earth Center direct. That looks like a 48 to 72 hour timeline. And I would expect that we have G2 geomagnetic storming that's likely going to result from that. It could be more severe than that, that we've already been in some significant geomagnetic storming over the past few days, which has preconditioned us. Now here we have our earthquake activity for the past 24 hours, and this is just showing what's occurring in Japan. You'll notice that this is set for the entire Earth for highest magnitude, and well, they're all taken up by these earthquakes in Japan, except for this one, Port Blair, India, which in fact is the location of an earthquake swarm that's been occurring on and off. So there's a few places on the earth right now which have been rumbling kind of continuously and they seem to activate when other areas activate. But here we have the 6.8 and 6.4. Typically, if you get an aftershock, it's gonna be one magnitude less. That's a pretty good rule. It's not always true, but in general, that's the deal. So a 6.8 would mean that the strongest aftershock would be a 5.8. This is a 6.4, that's 0.6 more. It's quite a lot more. You see the 5.9, 5.7, 5.6, 5.6, 5.5. .5. That is anomalous. In fact, this was already anomalous yesterday when I posted about the magnitude 5 earthquake swarm that was occurring there that ramped up to now this 6.8 and 6.4, which could ramp up more. It's very similar to what occurred with the Great Tohoku earthquake in 2011. And the thing is, is when you have a whole bunch of earthquakes in close magnitude proximity, and they're also pretty high magnitude, magnitude five would fit that definition very quickly, that makes it anomalous. I posted about this on Twitter. Japan does have a history of earthquake swarms. This is still anomalous and worth watching closely. And well, yeah, it was worth watching closely. And I think it's gonna to continue to be worth watching closely because I would say there's a very high likelihood now of there being a magnitude seven earthquake here, perhaps even a magnitude eight earthquake, because this is looking very similar to the great Tohoku earthquake sequence leading up to the magnitude 9.1. And this area right here has been loaded with seismic energy from Kamchatka, where we've had a ton of earthquakes, multiple magnitude sevens, that magnitude 8.8 .8 mega quake, tons of magnitude sixes and fives and fours. This would be the earthquake shadow this would be the earthquake shadow where you're having stress get relieved off the fault. But once you move out of that, this is the, the stress loading zone. This is a stress loading zone from all that seismic energy release. This is the uh, zone of one of the greatest seismic energy releases of all time since observations have begun. So the sixth strongest year on record for earthquake activity and almost all of it in terms of seismic energy uh, density is located right here. Now we have Japan acting back up and it recently ruptured too, that's the thing. If this was a while ago, like 50 years ago, then you know that fall has that time to cool down. It's also a time to build up, but when things are recent in time, they can stay activated. And 2011 is not that long ago. Here we see all the earthquakes that occurred in March of 2011, leading up to a minute before the Great Tohoku earthquake at 546 a.m. universal time on the 11th of March. And so you see how similar this looks to what's happening right now. And you'll notice the location is the exact same location. Again, we can go here. It is spot on the same location. So this is definitely something to be watching very closely, uh, as you can tell. And 7.3 is the highest earthquake. That was a foreshock sequence. That was the highest foreshock. If you just saw this, you could say, oh, that's pretty anomalous and that's an unusual earthquake swarm and 7.3 is pretty strong and you'd be right. And then a 9.1 occurred. So it ramped up significantly after that 7.3. So just because we have had a 6.8, 
and it's 6.4 does not mean that is all she wrote. If you have a magnitude 8 earthquake, the amount of energy that this is released is insignificant in comparison because you go up one order of magnitude and that is 32 times more energy. So going from a 6.8 to let's say an 8.8, that's about 1,000 times more energy in that earthquake. So if this is a four shock sequence for something bigger like a mega quake, which is certainly possible, also due to the space weather conditions that we are in and the planetary alignments that are forming for the rest of the year and going into January are very significant, this is not relieving any stress on the fault. That's a common misconception that, oh, well, it's gonna relieve stress on the fault. Well, if it's one one thousandth the, the strength of it, it's not doing anything. It's just showing, hey, I'm waking up, basically. So we have a lot of activity. One of the main things is this new X flare that just blasted off from Earth direct and center. This sunspot group is very large, very active, and we see that this is actually kind of stretching and arcing across this sunspot. So big blast of plasma from Earth direct and center. We could have more. This is the second X-class flare that we've had from the sunspot group. We also had an X-class flare from this sunspot group right here, which is yet to go Earth, center, and direct. So we have this entire sequence now for the next few days of these sunspots passing through this zone. And then eventually they will get to the limb and they can continue to blast off big solar flares and that would then lead to potentially radiation storms. And so when we have this sort of combination of earthquake swarming and then active energy pumping into the earth from these X flares and solar storm impacts, that's really quite significant. Uh, let's actually do a little analysis to see the time of this X class flare so we can see where it hit. So that was roughly at like 7, 8 a.m. universal time. Let's go over to our D region absorption model for uh, the Earth showing the impact of that flare. This was impacting right over the Indian Ocean. So we see that pretty clearly here. And you'll notice that we do have uh, this starting to hit Japan. So this was basically sunset for Japan. The sun was going down, it was right on the limb. So one of these cardinal axis points where you have the sun exactly setting when it blasted off that 1.7 X-class flare. Um, and then we were having these earthquakes occur as well. So pretty interesting timing because those earthquakes occurred 8.03 a.m. universal time and 8.54 a.m. universal time right here. And let us check our X-ray flux. And we go here for our X-ray flux. And we see that this was at 7.20, 7.30 a.m. universal time. So we had this solar flare and then like less than an hour later, we had those two big earthquakes. And so they seem to be connected. They certainly are temporally based off of that. We've already been having active geomagnetic conditions. We're preconditioned right now. Here we have our current HB60 index, a measure of geomagnetic volatility going from zero to nine. This one can actually go beyond nine and this is a one hour measure, so 60 minute. And we see this going back to the very end of October. We had some G1 storming, then things cooled off. Here is our G3 minus geomagnetic storm. We have three distinct phases. This G3 minus segment there, this G1 segment there, and then a G2 segment. So uh, one, two, three pulses of activity. We are now exiting out of that, but as we have this new solar storm impact come in, and there's already some others that are headed our way, expect this to go back up. And because the earth has already been storming, it's kind of preconditioned us to continue to have strong geomagnetic storming. So that is also something to be well aware of. Uh, so that is your update for today. Uh, two big earthquakes off the coast of Japan. That looks uh, honestly like a four shock sequence for something bigger, whether magnitude seven or magnitude eight. I would probably, if I had to really peg it down and explore that possibility, I would say high magnitude seven, low magnitude eight is uh, what would be at least a minimum there. You know, the Great Tohoku earthquake was a magnitude 9.1, right? Look how similar these are here. Just because they're similar doesn't mean that it's going to be the same thing. Very similar, that resulted in a 9.1. So that's a big difference. The Great Tohoku earthquake was absolutely devastating 
and this entire fault ruptured. And typically that would relieve the stress off of that fault. And maybe that is the case. Maybe that this is that's all that's going to happen for this, this sequence here. But with big sunspots still on the sun, clearly a connection between them and the timing. Again, that 1.7 and then within an hour of both of these earthquakes, there was foreshock activity leading up to this. We have those sunspots rotating through. That's charging the global electric circuit, the overall flow of energy around the globe. The ionosphere is getting charged up. All this affects this sort of geophysical activity. There is a very strong connection between the sun, the earth, all the planets, the interstellar medium, and more. Obviously, if you turn the sun off, everything goes cold and dark here. It's the main energy input for our planet. It's usually fairly steady. Doesn't mean it can't undergo uh, changes as well and cause shifts on our planet. To think otherwise is quite foolish. So I will keep you up to date every step of the way. Thank you all so much for watching. Again, I've been your host, Stefan Burns. We cover what's happening here energetically on the planet day by day, earthquakes, volcanoes, solar activity, space weather, planetary alignments, cosmic forces, and more. So if you like the sound of that, then please subscribe. Wishing each and every single one of you well. Please say some prayers for Japan because this is quite significant. Uh, we hope that we don't get another great Tohoku earthquake something like that. It's certainly possible though, because again, it's really important to keep in mind that this area has been loaded with a ton of energy from the earthquake sequence that's been ongoing here in Kanchaka in 2025. So I will keep you up to date. Thank you so much. Have a great day and I'll see you all very soon.